Welcome to Blue Crane Digital's introduction to the Nikon D3100 Basic Controls Training DVD. This latest addition to Nikon's line of entry-level DSLR cameras has been a worldwide success for beginning photographers. Why is it so popular? The answer is simple. It can capture stunning images. The D3100 is a piece of precision gear that has great potential. But remember, the quality of the image is really determined by the operator. You. We're going to simplify this complex piece of equipment for you. At the same time, you will gain the knowledge to take the photos you want. This presentation is not designed to replace your camera manual. Instead, it focuses on the most important features and controls of the camera. Camera manuals cannot teach you how to shoot great photos. They're designed as technical descriptions of how each component works. Manuals will not show you what the engineers had in mind when they decided how the camera controls should work together. Compare the camera manual to the owner's guide in the glove box of your car. You wouldn't dream of teaching yourself to drive just by reading it, would you? So, think of this presentation as a mini driver's education course for your camera. This presentation is broken down into four main sections. First, we will discuss topics that define the quality of your images. Second, we will help you understand the components of the camera. You will gain the basic tools you need to take better photos. Third, we will address some of the advanced features. You will see how these controls work together to create a correct exposure. Finally, we will demonstrate why checking your images often will improve your skills as a photographer. Keep the camera and the DVD remote close by as you watch. We want you to pause the presentation after each section. Test out the settings for yourself. Before we begin, here's a tip that can make learning this camera easier. Your camera comes with a user's manual. This manual provides a brief overview for setting up your camera. It can be carried in your bag for quick reference. However, the user's manual does not go into depth on many of the topics we'll be discussing in this presentation. For a more detailed explanation on the camera's features, you'll want to save a copy of the reference manual to your computer. The easiest way to do this is to use the reference manual software that came with the camera. Once you've inserted the disc, locate it on your computer. Click on the disc icon to reveal its contents. Then, open the folder labeled PDF. Inside, you will see a list of options. Choose the folder marked EN for English. Since the file is in PDF format, you'll need Adobe Reader to open it. Go to the File drop-down menu and choose Save a Copy to save the manual to your computer. For me, the manual is more useful and easier to review if I have a printed copy. Open the PDF file. Select the File Print option from your browser. Choose Fit to Printable Area from the Printer dialog box. This will allow you to print a larger copy of the manual. If you misplace the camera software, the reference manual can be downloaded from Nikon Service and Support webpage. Find your model among the list of cameras. Be sure to have your camera handy. Follow the instructions for downloading a printable copy. So let's get started. In about an hour, you will have the skills you need to take better photos. Before we begin, we need to make certain the viewfinder is in focus. Press the shutter release and look through the viewfinder. Use the side of your thumb to adjust the diopter dial. You want the focus points and the settings display to be sharply focused. The diopter adjustment must be correct for you to see the best image through the lens. When the adjustment is off, your eyes will strain to see the composition. If you share your camera with someone, be sure to check the diopter adjustment before every shoot. The key to understanding this camera is to break it down into simple concepts. New users of the D3100 are often overwhelmed by all the camera functions. They may find the menu system especially confusing. With all these options, you can set up the camera in thousands of combinations. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Usually, you won't need to think about these settings. Instead, you will use tools that are specific to your shooting style and subjects. These tools aren't in the menu system. They are set using the physical controls and display screen on the outside of the camera. 
The camera controls may appear confusing at first, but remember, their placement is the result of 60 years of SLR refinement. I guarantee that within two weeks, you won't want them anywhere else. Consider the physical controls on the right side of the camera. Each is used to control a setting related to shooting photos and recording movies. Notice how these controls are placed on the camera. They are within easy reach of your right thumb and forefinger. Your left hand doesn't have to move. You can use it to properly support the camera and lens as you make setting changes. Now, take a look at the row of buttons along the left side of the camera. Several of these, in addition to the delete button, are related to image playback. You'll use these when reviewing your photos. This camera displays information on current settings in both the viewfinder and on the information display screen. All of these numbers and symbols refer to camera controls. Most can be set by pressing this button and using the multi-selector. The information display should appear automatically when you turn on the camera. If it doesn't, press info on the top of the camera. Press it again to turn off the display. You will use the information display quite often to check the current camera settings. You can use it to change these settings as well. The viewfinder display will help you keep track of camera settings as you shoot. We are going to take you on a tour of the viewfinder. This will familiarize you with the names of all the camera controls. Don't worry, we don't expect you to know what all the settings mean just yet. As we proceed, we will show you where each number or icon appears on the information display. In order to follow along, you will need to turn the exposure mode dial to M. We'll look through the viewfinder and half press the shutter release. At the center of the viewfinder, you should see 11 focus points. When a focus point is active, the dot will turn red. If you have manually selected a focus point, the selected point will be displayed as a bracket inside a small box at the bottom of the information display screen. If the AF area mode is set to its default, this box will contain 11 plus signs. These represent the camera's 11 focus points. Along the bottom of the viewfinder, at the far left, we see the focus indicator. Once focus is locked, this indicator will light up. The camera will sound a soft beep. If the focus indicator blinks or does not come on when the shutter is half pressed, then the camera may be unable to focus on your subject. If you are focusing in continuous servo AF and tracking a moving subject, the focus indicator may blink or not appear at all. Next is the auto exposure lock indicator. The icon for auto exposure lock appears when you press this button on the back of the camera. Next, we see the shutter setting. Here, the shutter will open and close in 1 60th of a second. This setting indicates a shutter that will fire faster in 1 1 25th of a second. Longer exposures, approaching a second or more, will alert you with this double tick display. Moving on to the right, we see the aperture setting, or the size of the opening in the lens. A smaller number indicates a more open aperture. A larger number indicates the aperture is more stopped down. At the center of this row of icons is the exposure level indicator. In the program, shutter, and aperture modes, you can refer to this meter to help you set exposure compensation. In these modes, the exposure level indicator will appear once exposure compensation has been set. Move the marker to the right or left to under or overexpose your images. In manual mode, this meter is used as a guide to set the shutter speed and aperture value for a correct exposure. If you activate flash compensation or exposure compensation, these icons will appear next in the row. Above the compensation icons is the battery indicator. In the viewfinder, the battery indicator will only appear when the battery has a low or exhausted charge. Next is the ISO display. If you have the camera set to ISO Auto, then this icon will appear in the viewfinder. It will blink whenever the camera automatically sets an ISO different from the one that you selected. 
Normally, the space next to the ISO icon contains a number in brackets. This tells you how many photos you can take before the memory card fills up. Press the shutter release halfway and the indicator changes. Now, it shows the number of pictures that you can take in continuous release. The K icon will appear if enough memory remains for 1,000 exposures or more. Next, there is the flash ready indicator. And finally, this question mark is the warning indicator. It appears on the information display as well. When the question mark flashes, press this button. The camera will display warning information in the LCD monitor. We will refer back to the viewfinder and information display throughout this presentation. This will help increase your familiarity with the icons. The exposure mode dial is where you turn your camera to full automatic control and forget it, right? Millions of point and shoot photographers never changed this setting, but we're going to. First, we'll divide the exposure modes into groups so they make more sense. When you set the camera on auto, it does four things for you. It focuses the lens, the camera judges the amount of light and distance to your subject, then the camera sets the aperture setting or the size of the opening in the lens. And finally, it determines how fast the shutter should open and close. You snap the photo, you get an average exposure. Nikon expands upon this theme with scene modes. It's likely you have seen similar options on a point and shoot camera. The scene modes on the D3100 can be powerful tools for getting the photos you want. The camera automatically chooses the appropriate settings to match a variety of shooting situations. This allows you to document a bike race or a birthday party easily. You get to be involved in the moment rather than looking at the camera buttons and displays. We will begin with portrait mode. For this setting, the aperture is set wide open for a shallow depth of field. This keeps the subject in focus but softens the background. The subject will really stand out in the resulting image. Landscape works in the opposite way. The camera dials the aperture closed creating what's called an infinite depth of field. In a scene such as this, everything would appear in focus. The house on the far bluff would be just as sharply focused as the fence posts. Because the opening in the lens is small, the shutter must stay open longer to collect enough light. The camera sets the shutter speed long enough to create a correct exposure. However, it isn't so long as to risk any blur from camera movement. Use the landscape setting at night as well. The camera will set a very long shutter. Make sure to secure the camera on a tripod to avoid any movement. The child setting is ideal for taking snapshots of children. It retains the detail and vivid colors in the background while preserving the accurate skin tones of your subject. The camera sets the aperture slightly smaller than in portrait mode. However, the aperture lets in enough light to allow for faster shutter speeds. That way, you can catch children in action. In the sports setting, the camera selects a fast shutter speed to freeze the subject and background. By default, the camera continuously focuses on the subject behind the selected focus point. It will refocus as your subject moves. You won't miss any of the action. This setting works well for photographing children, animals, or any subject that might move unexpectedly. Close-up assumes you will be taking macro photographs of small subjects such as flowers or insects. This setting will allow you to take a sharply focused photo within several inches of your subject. If you want to get even closer, you will need to switch to a macro lens. When you set the dial to night portrait, the flash will fire to correctly illuminate the subject. The camera sets a slow shutter speed so the image sensor has more time to collect light from the background. Images taken in this mode will show both the subject and detail in the background. Place the camera on a tripod for the best results. Finally, there is the flash off setting. It is just like full auto except the flash will not fire. Think of these settings as flavors of automatic. They can be very useful if you don't have time to make decisions about the camera settings. The last feature on the mode dial we'd like to address is guide. This is not an individual shooting mode like auto or sports. Instead, Guide is a program designed to aid novice photographers. 
For instance, you may lend your camera to a family member or friend. They will likely be unfamiliar with how to set up the camera. This is where Guide can come in handy. Through a series of menus and prompts, Guide allows the user to make creative choices about the end result. They won't need to understand all the icons and controls to take a competent photo. However, for the most control over your images, you will need to turn the mode dial to one of these exposure settings. To understand the camera's autofocus system, let's first look at how it works in full automatic exposure mode. With the camera set to auto, look through the viewfinder and half press the shutter release. The camera will use one or several focus points to focus. Notice that the camera has selected a subject for focus. Usually, this will be the object closest to the lens. If your subject is farther away, then you won't get the results you wanted. This auto-focusing method is the default setting for most of the exposure modes. The exceptions are the sports and close-up scene modes. We will cover these two modes in just a minute. The best way to ensure that your camera focuses on the correct subject is to choose a focus point yourself. Manually selecting a focus point allows you to determine the area of focus. Turn the mode dial to close up. Now you have a choice. You can either use the center focus point to focus or you can select a new one by pressing the arrow keys on the multi selector. You can do this while looking through the viewfinder. This will make it easier to reposition the focus point to your subject. The sports mode lets you set the focus point as well. This setting is a little different. The camera still focuses on the subject behind the selected focus point. However, the surrounding focus points remain active. If the subject moves, the other focus points will take over and maintain focus. Focus point selection is available in all of the exposure modes. You will need to take the AF area mode off its default. We will demonstrate how to do this later in the presentation. In a few situations, your camera may not be able to focus at all. This can happen when there isn't enough contrast between the subject and background. The camera may not be able to focus when there are objects at different distances, such as the fence in front of this subject. The solution is to focus manually. Move the focus mode switch on the lens to M for manual focus. Turn the focus ring. Manual focus can be very useful when taking extreme close-ups of flowers. Use the autofocus system first to get the closest focus possible. Then switch to manual focus. You can use the focus ring to shift the focus to the exact point on the flower that you want. Or say you are shooting sunset photos from a tripod. The focus doesn't change as the sun goes down. However, the camera will lose the ability to lock the focus as the light fades. Switch to manual focus. Now you can continue shooting the sunset. You might be surprised at how many times you will need manual focus. It's just one more tool that you can use to get an extraordinary shot in difficult situations. Now is a good time to pause the presentation. Spend a few minutes reviewing what you've learned about scene modes, the autofocus system, and manual focus. Let's take a look at shutter priority. Remember that in auto, the camera meters the available light and automatically selects the shutter and aperture. This setting is just one small step away. The camera still meters the light. You decide how long the shutter stays open and the camera picks the correct aperture for a properly exposed photograph. If the shutter time is short, the aperture is more open to let in more light. A longer shutter makes the camera close down the aperture, letting in less light for a longer period. Whichever you choose, the camera will compensate. There is a graphic display on the back of the camera that can help you determine the correct relationship between the shutter speed and aperture value. The surrounding boxes represent the shutter speed, while the inner circle is the aperture size. As the shutter speed becomes shorter, more boxes will be illuminated. Notice that the size of the opening in the center of the circle has increased. Choose a longer shutter and the opening becomes smaller. The size of the opening, or the aperture size, has changed relative to the shutter speed. In shutter priority, the command dial controls the exposure setting. With the camera in shooting mode, turn the dial to select a shutter speed. 
If the words high or low appear in the aperture slot, then the shutter time you selected is either too long or too short for a properly exposed photograph. The exposure indicator will appear on the information display and in the viewfinder. The hash marks indicate how much the image is under or overexposed. Turn the command dial in the opposite direction until the aperture value returns. Now the camera can take a properly exposed photo. Pause the presentation and spend a couple of minutes adjusting the shutter until you feel comfortable with this setting. When would we use shutter priority? Here's one example. This photo was taken with a short shutter speed. The water is frozen in time. By making the shutter stay open longer, the quality of the water changes. In this photo, the water looks entirely different. With the shutter priority setting, you can decide what you want your image to communicate. Why else would you want to use shutter priority? Shooting sporting events where fast shutter speeds are critical is a common reason. This camera offers a sports setting on the mode dial, but since the camera doesn't know the situation, you may not get the results you were expecting. For instance, freezing a dog in mid-splash may not require the same fast shutter as freezing a race car going 100 miles per hour. Rather than use an average setting and risk an average picture, you can take control of your images. The next setting on the mode dial is Aperture Priority Auto. Before we go into detail on this setting, it's important to understand the concept of depth of field. This includes how it relates to the aperture size. The amount of light entering the camera is controlled by the aperture. It's like the pupil of your eye. In low light, your pupil gets larger so you can take in more light. The aperture is displayed as the number just to the right of the shutter speed. The smaller the number, the larger the aperture. So f4 is a larger opening than f11, which is a larger opening than f22. One of the main contributors to controlling the depth of field in a photograph is the size of the aperture when the photograph is taken. I want you to try a little experiment. You can stop this presentation and come back after you're done. First, go to a table in your house. Set a small object, such as a salt shaker, on the front edge. Next, place another object, such as a pepper mill, in the middle of the table. Finally. Place a third object on the back edge. Make sure that all three line up in a row as we've shown here. Now look at the objects from tabletop level and concentrate on the pepper mill. Look at the details in the mill itself. Once you are focused on the pepper mill, the other two objects will still be in view. Don't focus on them. Focus on the pepper mill. Do you perceive the other objects to be blurry or slightly out of focus? Yes. This is the way our eyes see and our mind perceives the world. We concentrate on those things that are important and let the rest fall away. If we can make the camera mimic this visual experience by shortening the depth of field, we can influence how people look at the photo and how they feel about the subject. Now step back and look at the whole table without concentrating on any one object. You perceive that all three objects are there, but you really don't notice the detail in any of them. The three objects are all included in your visual depth of field. How would it be if we, as photographers, decided what's important to look at? Painters have been doing this for hundreds of years. The artist decides where you focus your attention. It may be a face. It may be an orange on a table. It may be everything. But the difference between a snapshot and an artistic photograph is having the tools that enable us to make choices. We'll discuss composition later. But for now, we will concentrate on controlling this thing called depth of field. When the digital age came along with affordable digital cameras, we could finally take all the photos we wanted and review them instantly. We could take more pictures if we didn't like the results. But go back and look at all those images you took with your point and shoot digital camera. Everything is in focus. We were taking digital snapshots. There was minimal control over depth of field. Why? Digital point and shoot cameras focus the image on a tiny image sensor. Notice how small the lens is compared to your new SLR camera. 
The tiny lens focusing on a tiny chip results in images that have an infinite depth of field. Your digital SLR has a larger sensor. The depth of field possible is much closer to what the human eye sees. Now we are ready to cover aperture priority. For this setting, you will adjust the lens opening and the camera will do the rest. Turn the mode dial to A and look through the viewfinder. Half press the shutter release to focus. On the lower portion of your viewfinder, you will see the aperture information. Turn the command dial to set the aperture. In most situations, the camera will set a shutter speed to match your selected aperture. But under extreme conditions, the words high or low may replace the shutter speed. This indicates a setting that will not produce a properly exposed photo. Simply turn the command dial until the shutter speed number returns. There are four factors that determine the depth of field in a photograph. If you understand them, then controlling what is in or out of focus becomes much easier. We just explained how a large image sensor allows for a shallow depth of field. You can change the depth of field by moving your feet as well. Simply stepping closer to your subject will shorten the depth of field. You can see this when taking macro shots of small objects. The closer you are, the more shallow the depth of field becomes. For that reason, if you want to take macro shots with deep focus, you will need to stop down the aperture, to f22 for example. The third factor in controlling depth of field is focal length. Right now I'm being shot with a telephoto lens. As you can see, my face is in focus, but the foreground and the background have gone soft. Now, as we pull back and change to a shorter focal length, watch the foreground and the background come into focus. Finally, you can control depth of field by adjusting the size of the lens aperture. Pause this presentation and spend a few minutes getting familiar with these controls. Come back when you're ready to continue. When would we use aperture priority? As we discussed previously, aperture is a determining factor in setting the depth of field. Sometimes you want an infinite depth of field or deep focus. Other times you want a shallow depth of field. Your composition, subject matter, and context all play a role in finding the right balance. Experiment with taking photos at different apertures. Here is an example. Have your subject stand about 8 feet in front of a background of plants. Stand about 6 feet from your model. Put a telephoto lens on your camera and zoom your lens to 100 millimeters. This is considered a good portrait focal length. Set the camera on aperture priority and open the lens using the command dial. Take the first shot. Now dial the aperture closed and take another photo. In the photo taken with an open aperture, can you see how the subject pops off the page? There is a greater separation between the subject and background in this photo than in the image taken with the aperture dialed closed. Now that you understand the shutter and aperture controls, turn your camera to program mode. Think of programmed auto as auto with options. Just as in auto, the camera chooses the appropriate shutter speed and aperture value. But by turning the command dial, you can extend the usefulness of programmed auto. As you turn the dial one direction, the shutter speed becomes faster while the aperture opens up. When you turn the dial in the opposite direction, the shutter time gets longer and the aperture closes. You still have a correct exposure, but by turning the dial, you can also control the image qualities that we covered in the aperture and shutter priority modes. When the exposure settings for program mode have been changed from their defaults, the letter P in an asterisk will appear in the information display and in the viewfinder. This is referred to as flexible program mode. To return this mode to its default, rotate the command dial until the asterisk disappears, or just turn the mode dial. Using P can be a great way to freeze the action or control the depth of field in your image, depending on the situation. You have already learned how to take better photos simply by taking control of the exposure settings. From here, we'll cover the most common setting changes. Most of these controls can be set from the information display. Press the information edit button. 
The screen will change and a yellow highlight box will appear. Think of the yellow box as your cursor and the multi-selector as your mouse. Move the box around the display to any available camera function. Press OK. A new screen will appear with setting information. Use the multi-selector to make changes. Press OK to confirm. To return to the shooting mode, press the information edit button again or half press the shutter release. The new selection will appear on the screen. Until you are more familiar with the buttons and menus, you may find it easier to set up the camera through the information display. Let's practice using the information display by changing the image quality and size. Press the information edit button. Using the multi-selector, navigate to this area of the screen. Select the top option to change the image quality. Press OK. The following settings are available for quality. RAW, also referred to as NEF, three JPEG options, and a RAW file combined with a JPEG. With JPEGs, you have a choice of how much compression to apply. Fine applies very little compression, approximately 4 to 1, while normal applies quite a bit, on the order of 8 to 1. For the basic setting, the compression rate is even higher, approximately 16 to 1. In addition, you can select the size or number of pixels representing the JPEG file. The choices are large, medium, and small. Large and RAW can each save image files that are approximately 4600 pixels wide. Medium JPEGs are more than 3400 pixels wide. Small results in a JPEG that is a little more than 2300 pixels wide. Which image size should you choose? That depends upon how you plan to use your photos. If you want to print out posters, then select RAW. Choose the large fine JPEG setting to print images up to 10 by 15. The medium setting is good for photos as large as 8 by 12. If you only need to email your photos or post them on the internet, then select small. At this setting, the image quality is good enough to print in 5 by 7 format, but the actual file size is a little more than 2 megabytes. While large JPEGs offer a lot of data to work with, Shooting in RAW really gives you the maximum flexibility when editing your photos. That's because it preserves the most original data. When you shoot in JPEG, all the tonal qualities of the image are applied when the image is compressed and saved on the card. These include sharpness, contrast, exposure, and color temperature. If you make adjustments on your computer, then you will sacrifice some of the image data. With RAW, the image data is stored as it's recorded on the sensor. All the tonal property settings are noted, but not applied to the image. Another advantage of shooting in RAW is you reduce some of the potential for digital noise. JPEG compression can add noise and artifacts to your images. Uncompressed RAW images have a cleaner starting point. RAW photos must be opened with special image processing programs. The program displays raw images using the current tonal properties. However, you can make adjustments without worrying about losing any data. Raw images store 12 bits of data for each pixel, instead of 8 bits for JPEG images. This may be most important to you in high contrast images like this one. You want to retain the details in the bright clouds, but still be able to see into the shadows. The sensor still sees the same image. But with 12 bits, you may retain more detail at the bright and dark limits of the recorded photo. On a film camera, ISO refers to film speed. This is, of course, a digital camera. There is no film. Digital camera designers use this convention from the film world to describe electronic sensor gain. This is when the camera amplifies the signal to make the image bright enough to be seen. Many of you have tried shooting video in extremely low light situations. You may be able to see the image, but the overall quality of the video is not very good. That's because the image was captured by electronically enhancing the sensor. At higher ISO settings, the enhanced sensor can add noise to your images and videos. They will turn out looking grainy. ISO Auto is the default setting for the automatic exposure modes. The camera selects an appropriate ISO 
based on the lighting conditions. Most of the time, you will likely leave the ISO setting on auto. At its default, the auto ISO range is between 100 and 3200. For the advanced modes, ISO is set to the default value of 100. ISO Auto is available in these modes. However, you will need to activate it from the shooting menu. With your camera set to one of the advanced modes, press Menu. Use the up or down arrow keys on the multi selector to highlight the camera icon. You will see a list of options for the shooting menu. Press the right arrow key to enter the menu. Highlight ISO sensitivity settings and press OK. Use the multi selector to turn auto ISO sensitivity on. Anytime the camera is set to ISO Auto, this icon will appear in the information display and in the viewfinder. Now, select an ISO. You can do this from the information display. Highlight this icon and use the multi selector to choose an ISO value. Your options range from 100 to 3200, plus two high settings that extend ISO up to 12,800. If you select one of the high settings, you will need to return to the ISO sensitivity menu. Change the maximum ISO in auto to include the high setting. As you shoot, the camera will use your selected ISO. If the camera cannot set an appropriate shutter speed and aperture value with your ISO setting, ISO auto will take over. The camera will change the ISO. This icon will blink in the information display and in the viewfinder. When you play back the resulting image, the ISO number will appear in red on this information screen. This camera does a great job of selecting the right ISO for the lighting conditions. Your images will be correctly exposed, however, you may not always like the results. For example, the camera selected an ISO of high 1 or the equivalent of 6400 for this image. There is a lot of digital noise. If your goal is to get the shot no matter what, then digital noise won't matter. But if you need the cleanest image possible, the ISO cannot go above 1600. For this reason, you may want to set a specific ISO. If you are shooting in one of the scene modes, simply use the information display screen to select your preferred setting. In the advanced modes, you will have to first go to the ISO sensitivity settings submenu and turn ISO auto off. Then, choose your preferred ISO. The ISO will be fixed at the selected value. Experiment with the ISO settings. Your goal will be to introduce as little amplification as possible. At the same time, you want a fast enough shutter speed to avoid blur. This camera allows you to take single shots. It allows you to record a continuous burst of images. The camera allows you to set a self timer as well. All of these functions are grouped under one setting called release mode. Use the release mode selector on top of the camera to set this feature. Your choices are single frame, continuous, self timer and quiet shutter release. Most new owners of the D3100 set the release mode to either single frame or continuous shooting. Position the release mode selector to the preferred setting. The icon for the current release mode will appear on the information display. Choose continuous for moving subjects. You will improve your chances of recording an extraordinary image over a series of shots. For stationary subjects, set the release mode to single frame. You won't need to worry about accidentally recording several shots when you only meant to record one image. The self timer is great for taking shots from a tripod that require no camera movement. By default, the camera counts down 10 seconds before taking the shot. Any static image destined to become a large print might be a candidate for the self timer. Use this setting for self portraits as well. If you use the self timer, you may wish to remove the rubber eye cup and attach the eyepiece cap that came with the camera. This will prevent light from entering the camera through the viewfinder and accidentally interfering with the exposure. Finally, there is quiet shutter release for situations where you want to make sure you don't disturb your subject. It works just like single frame with one exception. The camera records an image but does not reset the shutter mechanism until you remove your finger from the shutter release. This gives you the opportunity to step away with your finger still on the shutter release. Once out of your shot, you can reset the shutter.
Since we have started changing the camera settings, now is a good time to learn how to return the shooting settings to their default condition. It's frustrating to discover the settings are incorrect after you start shooting. This is likely to happen if you share your camera with someone. Reset the camera before each shoot. Then, set the camera controls to your preferences. Press Menu. Use the multi-selector to access the shooting menu. Highlight Reset Shooting Options and press OK. Choose Yes and confirm your selection. This will return the shooting settings such as white balance and image quality to their defaults. Resetting the shooting settings can quickly return you to a consistent starting point. If you are moving up from a point and shoot camera, the live view screen should look familiar. While the viewfinder is ideal for framing your subjects, live view can be useful in certain shooting situations. Nikon's live view is very similar to the large screen your point and shoot camera provided for framing photos. To activate live view, rotate this switch to the right. The camera's reflex mirror will flip up. This allows the image to go directly to the image sensor. With the camera set to its defaults, you would half press the shutter release to focus. The focus point will turn green and begin blinking. When the camera achieves focus, the focus point will stop blinking and the camera will sound a beep. Check the focus by pressing the zoom in button. You can magnify the image to nearly seven times its normal size. Use the zoom out button to return to full screen view. You can determine where the camera focuses by choosing an AF area mode. Go to the shooting menu and choose AF area mode from the list of options. Since we are working in live view, highlight live view movie and press OK. There are four options in all, face priority AF, wide area AF, normal area AF, and subject tracking AF. Select normal area for static shots taken from a tripod. This focusing method is well suited to macro photography. For this setting, the camera focuses on the subject behind the selected focus point. By default, the point will be in the center of the screen. Use the arrow keys on the multi-selector to move the box to your subject. Press OK to return the focus point to the center of the screen. This will give you pinpoint control over where the camera focuses. Wide area is similar to normal area. The difference is wide area uses a larger box for focusing. Just as with normal area, you can move the focus point by using the multi-selector. Choose this setting when photographing static subjects without a tripod, for instance, landscapes. Wide area is the default for the advanced exposure modes and the sports setting. You may prefer to set the AF area mode through the information display. With Live View active, press the Information Edit button and use the multi-selector to highlight the current AF area mode. Now, let's look at how face priority works. This will help you take portraits and group shots. When the camera detects a person in the scene, it places a yellow focus point with two borders over their face. For a group photo, the camera will place the focus point with two borders over the closest face in the scene. Use the multi-selector to move the frame to your main subject of focus. Finally, there is subject tracking. Use this setting to follow a moving subject as it travels through a scene. When you choose subject tracking, a special focus point will appear center screen. Place your subject behind it, then press the OK button. The focus point will turn yellow when it has registered the subject you want to track. Half press the shutter to focus. Now, as your subject moves, the camera will follow it. When you are ready, press the shutter release to take the photo. Press the OK button again to disengage focus. Then, choose a new subject. You can focus in this AF area mode by half pressing the shutter release without first pressing OK. However, the camera will not track your subject. Subject tracking could be useful for shots of moving subjects, such as animals at the zoo or athletes at a sporting event. In addition to choosing an AF area mode, you can select the focus mode as well. While the AF area mode determines where the camera focuses, the focus mode decides when the camera will focus. You may want to lock the focus on your subject, or perhaps you want to maintain focus on a subject as it moves. Choosing the correct focus mode will help you accomplish these goals. The only way to set the focus mode is through the information display. 
highlight this icon and press OK. There are three options, single servo AF, full-time servo AF, and manual focus. The default is single servo. For this option, autofocus is initiated when you half press the shutter release. Once focus is achieved, it will remain locked until you let up on the shutter. Single servo is ideal for stationary subjects. Use this setting for portrait, landscape, or macro photography. For moving subjects, consider choosing full-time servo. Autofocus will begin as soon as live view is activated. You can use full-time servo with any of the AF area modes. The camera will continuously focus on the subject behind the current focus point. Focus is initiated without pressing the shutter. If the focus point turns red, the camera is unable to focus. Half press the shutter until the focus point turns green. When you are ready, press the shutter to take the photo. The camera will check the focus before recording the image. One final note about working in live view. The autofocus system will take longer to focus than in regular shooting. If this is a concern, use the viewfinder for most shooting situations. For the most control over focusing in live view, select Manual Focus. Move the focus mode switch on your lens to M for manual focusing. Use the multi-selector to move the focusing frame to your subject. You may want to press the zoom in button once or twice to make focusing easier. Now turn the lens focus ring. You can either press the zoom out button to return to full view before taking the shot or just take it from here. The live view screen displays icons for the current camera settings. You've already seen most of these icons on the information display or in the viewfinder. If you press info when live view is active, the display will change. Fewer icons will appear at the top. This creates a less cluttered screen for viewing your subject. Press info again to bring up a framing grid. Use the grid if your photographs often turn out crooked. It will help you line up horizontals and verticals in your composition. You can make setting changes from any of the live view screens. Press the information edit button. Just as with regular shooting, this will activate the information display. Use the multi selector to make your changes. When you are done, Press Information Edit to return to the Live View screen. Just a note, if you're shooting in auto exposure, the camera will determine the appropriate scene mode based on your subject. When autofocus is initiated, the icon for the scene mode chosen by the camera will appear in the upper corner of the Live View screen. This camera can record up to a 10 minute clip of full HD quality video. In fact, the video you're watching right now was shot with the D3100. Activate movie recording the same way you would live view. Movie recording uses many of the same settings as live view. Frame up your subject in the LCD monitor. Half press the shutter release to focus. Then press the movie record button to begin recording. The red recording indicator will appear in the monitor as you shoot. These numbers tell you the time remaining for your video. Press the movie record button again to end recording. Movie shooting offers the same focusing options as live view. We've already discussed the AF area and focus mode options. These features function identically in movie shooting as in live view. However, we would like to take a moment to point out the real potential of full time servo when shooting movies. With previous generations of Nikon cameras, the only way to adjust the focus once recording began was to do it manually. Focusing manually can be difficult to do well. Using the auto focus system locked the focus during recording. If you wanted to shoot a moving subject or were panning the camera, your video could become out of focus. Full time servo attempts to resolve this problem. When you select this option, the camera will maintain focus on your subject even after recording begins. You won't have to worry about an out of focus video. Combine full-time servo with subject tracking for situations when you want to ensure focus on a moving subject. Once you've pressed OK to register your subject, use the shutter release to focus. Then begin recording. The camera will track and maintain focus on your subject throughout the video. There are a couple of drawbacks, however, to full-time servo when shooting movies. First, full-time servo may have difficulty maintaining focus on your subject in scenes where there is very little contrast 
or when shooting in low light. This could result in videos with inconsistent fluctuations in focus. Second, because the autofocus system is running constantly, the sound of the focusing motor will be audible throughout the resulting video. If audio quality is important, set the focus mode to single servo instead. If you want to adjust the focus after recording has begun, half press the shutter to refocus the camera. It is important to select the correct recording size for your videos. This will make the process of sharing your videos with family and friends easier. You can select the movie recording size from the information display screen or go to the movie settings page in the shooting menu. Here you will find an additional option for sound. Turn this feature off if you want to record videos without any audio. To see the options for movie recording size, choose quality. There are three sizes. They are 1920 by 1080, 1280 by 720, and 640 by 424. The default is 1920 by 1080. Each recording size has an assigned frame rate. Frame rate refers to the number of frames recorded per second of video. The Nikon engineers decided to apply a standard frame rate of 24 frames per second to the three different recording sizes. The exception is the 1280 by 720 setting which has the additional options of 30 and 25. To understand why the engineers chose 24 frames per second as the standard frame rate, we have to consider how the camera stores video information. A professional video camera records lightly compressed video at 30 frames per second. Unlike a professional video camera, a DSLR must heavily compress video data in order to fit it on a small memory card. In the process, image data must be discarded. One way to retain more image data is to record at a slower frame rate. By recording fewer frames of video per second, more data can be retained from each frame of video. Less information for each frame will have to be discarded before it's stored on the memory card. The Nikon engineers understood that the majority of the video shot with the D3100 would be played on computer monitors or on a TV connected to the camera. For this type of viewing environment, 24 frames per second is a suitable compromise. It allows the camera to capture smooth motion while recording the most image data. Even video containing moderate movement should appear smooth when playing it back. If your goal is to record video at the highest quality possible, choose the 1920 by 1080 setting. At this setting, the camera will record full high definition video. One drawback, however, is the file size will be much larger compared to the other settings. This could quickly fill up your memory card. If you intend to record a lot of video, for instance a t-ball game, Select a smaller recording size instead. Choose the 640 by 424 setting for videos you wish to email. Although the camera will only record standard definition video, the file size will be more manageable. You will be able to fit more video on your memory card. The 1280 by 720 setting records video that is just a step below full HD. Choose the 24 frames per second option for scenes with very little movement. This will give you the best image quality for the 1280 by 720 recording size. In contrast, if you are shooting a scene with a lot of movement, or if you intend to broadcast your video on TV, select 30 frames per second. The camera will record more frames of video per second. The action in the resulting clip will appear more smooth. The 30 frames per second setting is intended for NTSC video systems. That's the standard for North America and parts of Asia. If your video will be displayed on a TV in Europe or other areas that use the PAL format, then you'll want to choose 25 frames per second. To get the most out of this camera's video capabilities, pick up Blue Crane Digital's Shoot Great Video with your Nikon DSLR. This DVD demonstrates the techniques you need to shoot professional quality video with a DSLR. It includes lighting techniques, tips for avoiding aliasing, and advice on how to record better audio. As photographers, our goal is to convey our personal outlook and view of the world in the form of photographs. Good photographic composition can help you express your visual ideas. Following the guidelines of composition won't guarantee award-winning photos, but I can promise you this, your shooting will improve. 
I'm not asking you to memorize the rules and follow them by rote. Good photographers sometimes break the rules, but they know why and they do it for a reason. You probably have a friend or a relative who always seems to have a stack of vacation or holiday snapshots. In every batch, there may be one or two interesting shots, but the rest are pretty boring. Most people simply don't know how to make their photos interesting. They don't know how to arrange their subjects and backgrounds in an appealing way. That's what we're going to discuss now. The principles of good composition can be learned. As you look at a potential shot through the viewfinder, move the camera around to find the best image. You can zoom with your feet as well. Moving a short distance can sometimes make all the difference. Here's a concept that will help you find the best arrangement of elements. It's called the rule of thirds, and it's been used by artists for hundreds of years. Divide the horizontal plane and the vertical plane into thirds. The intersections of these lines are the best places to locate important subjects. If you have a subject with prominent lines or edges, such as a building or a seascape, place them along the rule of thirds lines. A few words about horizons. Never allow the horizon to cross the image plane exactly in the middle. If you want to feature a subject that lies above the horizon, such as a beautiful sunset, place the horizon lower than the center line. If your main area of interest is below the horizon, arrange the shot so that the horizon is higher than the center line. Teach yourself to visualize the thirds when you're looking at photographs and artwork. You will notice that professional photographers use this concept all the time. You will see the rule of thirds in television commercials, movies, and documentaries. A problem with so many snapshots is that the people are so tiny you can hardly tell who they are. The photographers tried to cram a lot of information about who and where into one photograph. It doesn't work. The solution is to get specific with your framing. Fill the viewfinder with the important stuff, the people, and enough of the surrounding details to identify the location. Then take additional photos to explore the place, the view, the architecture, the food. A photograph, like a painting or a drawing, is a two-dimensional object. The big issue facing photographers is this. How do you depict the three-dimensional world on two-dimensional paper? How do you avoid a flat look to your photos? There are things you can do to help the viewer see the third dimension. Rule number one. You must understand the technical aspects of focusing your camera. Focus is the most important component of making a good photograph. The sharp edges and clarity of the focus subject engage the eye of the viewer. To make your area of sharp focus more forceful, contrast it against an area of softer focus. To control the line between sharp and soft focus, you must understand depth of field and put it to work in your images. The contrast of a sharply focused subject against a soft background will greatly intensify the illusion of three dimensions. A few more tips that can add depth. If possible, take advantage of overlapping objects. Overlaps show that one object is in front of another object in space. Use this trick to give your photographs the feeling of space and depth in the real world. Elements of perspective can be used to enhance the third dimension. Things like a line of telephone poles going away from you, or a row of arches in a building, or a road winding off into the distance. Buildings can be great sources of perspective clues. Look at what happens with walls and roof lines as they rise up and away from you. These are all indications that the scene has space and depth. We have talked about a number of things that you can do to improve your photographs through composition. We talked about the rule of thirds, which will help you place your subject in the photographic plane. We talked about sharp and soft focus, and discuss ways to create depth and space. We have only begun to touch on the subject of photographic composition. If you'd like to find out more, complete books on the subject are available. Use these guidelines and you'll be thinking about photographs in a new way. We have reached the point in this presentation where we will launch into more advanced topics. The majority of the settings we will discuss cannot be changed in the full auto or scene modes. 
but the concepts such as white balance, metering, and focus are important to understand, no matter which exposure mode you choose. Keep your camera and remote at hand, and try out each setting before proceeding to the next topic. White balance is a topic that can either be very simple or a little more involved, based on your needs as a photographer. Happily, the camera gives you white balance settings that work well under a variety of conditions. First, a short explanation of color temperature. When we shoot photographs, we can have a variety of light sources, each with its own characteristics. Color temperature refers to the spectrum of visible light illuminating an object. We measure the light spectrum in what is called Kelvin temperature. The physics behind Kelvin calculations can be tricky, so just think of it this way. Each color corresponds to a specific Kelvin temperature. You would get just about the same color if you heated carbon to the same temperature on the Celsius scale. For example, carbon glows red at 2000 degrees centigrade, but when it's heated to 5500 degrees, it is white hot. In the same way, the white light of the noonday sun measures about 5200 kelvins. At that time of day, the Earth's atmosphere is allowing the entire visible spectrum of light to pass through and illuminate our world. An hour after sunrise, or an hour before sunset, the curvature of the Earth and the atmosphere restricts the amount of light that can reach us. When the sun is low above the horizon, the atmosphere scatters short wavelength colors, such as blue and violet. But long wavelength colors, such as red and yellow, come to us through the atmosphere, creating a more golden colored light. In this case, the color temperature is lower, about 2900 degrees. We've all seen a red sunset, or the golden light that is so beautiful an hour before the sun goes down. The light given off by incandescent bulbs is similar to this light. In contrast, candlelight is very red, with a very low color temperature. Think of how your friends look sitting in front of a fireplace. Firelight is about 1900 degrees Kelvin. We're not talking about the intensity of the light, but rather the composition of the light spectrum. Most of the time, we want to represent the true color of something. We want the people in our pictures to have natural skin tones. This camera has many settings for white balance. Each is designed to compensate for a specific light source. Let's look at auto white balance first. In this setting, the camera meters the light coming through the lens and compensates for the color temperature being recorded. Auto white balance causes the exposure to appear as if it was made under natural sunlight. In cloudy daylight conditions, the clouds actually block out some of the longer waves, resulting in a color temperature higher or bluer than bright sunlight. Shady conditions usually have a higher color temperature, about 8,000 degrees. Auto white balance filters out the blue shifting the colors back toward the red and yellow range. If you are shooting indoors under incandescent light or firelight, the auto white balance shifts the camera settings back toward the blue range. This shift results in skin tones that look natural. If you want this natural sunlight look, the auto white balance setting does a remarkable job. For many photographers, this is a setting that never gets changed. But, you can use the optional white balance values, such as daylight and fluorescent, to create better photographs before you upload the images into your computer. Let's say you're taking a walk just before sunset. The light is making everything a beautiful golden color. The shadows are fantastic. If you're shooting JPEG images in auto white balance, the camera will shift everything toward blue to compensate for the yellow-orange light. Then, it will compress your image and store it on your memory card. That beautiful light is gone. You can use software to shift the color back toward the yellow-orange range later, but it's work that can be avoided. You will be losing data from your original image. Why? The program you use to shift the colors will compress your JPEG file a second time, discarding more of the original data. You may decide to print this photo, but you've already given data away twice. If you set the white balance correctly at the time you take the photo, you won't have to spend time fixing it later. In order to understand exactly what the white balance setting does, we have to do a little experiment. Go outside on a bright day and pick a subject to photograph. Go to white balance and make certain the camera is set to auto white balance. Take a photo of your subject. 
change the white balance setting to direct sunlight and take another photo. You can do this on screen in live view as we have. Continue until you have tested out each white balance setting. Review the photos on your computer. As you scroll through the images, you will notice that each image has a different hue. For example, the image taken with the incandescent light setting looks very blue. But wait, don't incandescent lights have an orange hue? So why did the image turn out blue? You have to think about it backwards. The camera shifts the color into the blue range because it's set for taking images in the equivalent of an incandescent light bulb. Under those conditions, adding blue to an image makes it look as though it was taken in natural daylight. However, the photo was taken under natural light, which includes the blue spectrum. As a result, the camera added a lot of blue on top of the already present blue light. The result is an image that is very blue. Conversely, when the white balance is set to shade, the camera will shift the color balance toward the red end of the spectrum. Under natural daylight, which includes reds and oranges, you will end up with an abundance of orange and yellow hues in your image. So, if you're shooting an hour before sunset and you want to capture that golden light, try setting the white balance to direct sunlight rather than selecting auto white balance. This will record more of the yellow-orange light your eye perceives. Exposure compensation is one of the most important controls on your camera. Once you understand how it works, you'll find yourself using exposure compensation all the time. Typically, photographers use this function to correct the exposure on backlit subjects. In addition, they use exposure compensation for subjects that are brighter than the background. For example, here is a backlit tower. The camera sets the exposure for the bright sky, making the tower in the foreground look dark. We use exposure compensation to increase the exposure for the subject in the foreground. The background is blown out, but the tower is correctly exposed. You can set exposure compensation through the information display screen. Press the information edit button and use the multi selector to set exposure compensation. Increase or decrease the exposure by up to 5 EV steps. Choose a positive value to overexpose the image. Selecting a negative value will underexpose the image. Another way to set exposure compensation is to press and hold this button on top of the camera. Then rotate the command dial. The value you select will appear on the information display screen. You can also use this procedure to change exposure compensation while looking through the viewfinder. This allows you to make minute changes to the exposure without pulling your eye away from the viewfinder. With the exposure compensation button pressed, turn the command dial to the left to overexpose the image. Turn it to the right to underexpose the image. The value you select will appear in the viewfinder anytime you press the exposure compensation button. Just be aware, if you select a value that's beyond 2 EV steps, this arrow will appear in the viewfinder and the information display. The following experiment will help you better understand exposure compensation. Go outside and position your subject in a shady spot that looks out onto a brightly lit scene. Set the mode dial to P and turn on live view. Frame your subject so that you can see a generous amount of the bright background. Take a picture. The camera will set an average exposure for the entire scene. As a result, your subject is underexposed. The bright background is correctly exposed. Press the exposure compensation button on the top of the camera and rotate the command dial to the left to increase exposure compensation. Take another photo. The background may be blown out, but the exposure is right for your subject. Now it's time for the second part of this experiment. Turn the camera and your subject around. You should be shooting from the sunny spot into the shadows. Your subject is lit by the sun while the rest of the frame is filled with shadows. Take a photo without exposure compensation. The camera still sets an average exposure for the scene. As a result, your subject is overexposed. Use exposure compensation to decrease the exposure. The background will appear dark, but your subject won't look blown out. Consider using exposure compensation during movie shooting to achieve a specific exposure. Professional photographers use exposure compensation all the time. It can be crucial to getting the exact exposure you want. 
To clear this setting, return compensation back to zero, or just reset the shooting options. Just as in live view, the AF area mode in regular shooting determines where the camera chooses to focus. This feature is available in all of the exposure modes. There are different AF area modes in regular shooting than in live view. To change the AF area mode from the information display, highlight this box and press OK. Or you can access this feature from the shooting menu. Press menu and navigate to the camera icon. Press the right arrow key or the OK button. Then highlight AF area mode and press OK again. Choose Viewfinder. You will see a list of options. They are Single Point AF, Dynamic Area AF, Auto Area, and 3D Tracking. The default for most of the exposure modes is Auto Area. For this setting, the camera chooses a focus point or points by searching for faces, objects close to the lens, or groups of objects in the center of the frame. Auto Area works well for many shooting situations. But if you want control over where the camera focuses, you'll need to select one of the other options. Let's begin with single point. For this setting, use the multi selector to choose one of the 11 focus points. The selected focus point will appear as brackets inside a small box at the bottom left of the information display. Move the brackets to choose a new focus point. You can use the multi selector to choose a point while looking through the viewfinder as well. You won't have to pull your eye away from your subject. This will improve your chances of capturing a great shot. If you choose single point with the mode dial set to either P, S, A, or M, the camera will apply this setting to all the advanced exposure modes. If you are shooting in auto or one of the scene modes, the AF area mode will return to its default anytime you change the exposure mode. Select single point from macro shots taking portraits, or any other stationary subject. For moving subjects, try Dynamic Area. You still select a single focus point for your subject, but the surrounding focus points remain active. If your subject moves, the focus points around the selected point take over. This allows the camera to maintain focus on your subject. Finally, there is 3D tracking. This is similar to subject tracking in live view. Choose a focus point, then initiate autofocus. Anytime your subject enters a new area of focus, the focus point moves along with your subject. This setting can be useful when framing subjects along the rule of thirds lines. Focus on the subject in the center of the viewfinder. Keep the shutter release half pressed. Now reframe your shot. Because the point moves, your subject will remain in focus. Just taking control of where the camera focuses will result in consistently better photographs. We already talked a little bit about selecting a focus point and where the camera focuses, but how do you decide when to focus? You may be taking a portrait of someone standing completely still, or you may be at the zoo where an animal's movement is unpredictable when the camera focuses will have an impact on the quality of your image. The D3100 has a setting appropriate to each of those situations and one for everything in between. You can change the focus mode through the information display. Highlight this icon and press OK. The options are Auto Servo AF, Single Servo AF, Continuous Servo AF, and Manual. Let's begin with option 2. With single servo, the camera locks the focus when you half press the shutter release. If focus is achieved, the focus indicator will appear in the viewfinder and the camera will sound a soft beep. This setting is good for stationary shots such as portraits or landscapes. Now we will move to the third option. This is called continuous servo. In this focus mode, the camera continuously searches for the correct focus behind the selected focus point. Focusing will not stop until you release the shutter. The focus indicator will either blink or not appear at all. This setting is great for constantly moving objects such as small children or animals. Auto Servo AF is something in between. Auto Servo starts out just like single servo. The camera locks the focus on the subject behind the focus point. The focus indicator will appear in the viewfinder and the camera will beep. 
When the subject moves, the camera switches over to continuous servo. It searches constantly for the correct focus. Auto Servo AF is the default focus mode. This setting is really the best of both options 2 and 3. For most situations, you can just let the camera change from single to continuous as needed. However, it's important to note that the focus mode you select will affect how AF area works. For example, when the focus mode is set to single servo, you will not be able to select 3D tracking. In addition, dynamic area AF will only work properly when the focus mode is set to either auto servo or continuous servo. If you set the focus mode to single servo, the camera will not keep the surrounding focus points active. You will not be able to maintain focus if your subject moves. One final note about focus modes. The shutter will not fire unless the camera achieves focus. This button on the back of your camera allows you to lock the exposure and the focus. You can use this feature to get a correct exposure on a backlit subject. It is useful when shooting high contrast scenes. In either case, you would focus on your subject by half pressing the shutter release. Keep the shutter release half pressed as you find a neutral subject in the scene that is not backlit. Press the AE lock button to lock the exposure. Keep your thumb on this button as you reframe to include your subject. Then take the shot. For this situation, focus on your backlit subject. Then point the camera toward the leaves or the tree. You would press AE lock to lock the exposure. Then reframe to include your subject and take the shot. The camera should expose the subject correctly even if the background is blown out. Continue to hold this button if you want to take more than one photo with this exposure setting. This camera comes equipped with three metering options. They are matrix, center weighted, and spot. The default setting is matrix. The entire frame is considered. The camera takes an average exposure to capture as many highlights and shadows as possible. This setting does a great job most of the time, even with some backlighting. It's true that matrix metering measures distance, color, and contrast. All these things are important. However, the primary thing metering does is determine how dark or light the frame is. Next is center weighted. The camera still looks at the entire scene. However, more importance is given to the center of the frame. The last option is spot metering. Here, the camera uses a small percentage of the frame for its measurement. If the camera is set to single or dynamic area AF, then metering will be based on a 3 mm space around the current focus point. If it is set to auto area, the camera will measure around the center focus point. Try pressing AE lock in center weighted or spot metering. If the camera is set to matrix metering, this feature will not work correctly. In difficult lighting, you can ensure your subject will be properly exposed. Simply meter on the subject you consider to have a middle value. Many advanced photographers use center-weighted metering as their default choice. They lock the focus and metering by pressing AE lock. Then they reframe their photo and take the shot. The pop-up speed light can improve the quality of your photographs in a variety of lighting conditions. Some flash photos look blown out. With the correct settings, the flash will enhance your subject instead. Most beginning photographers use the flash on their camera when they are indoors under low light. Here's a tip. Use your flash outside under bright sunny skies. The flash will fill in some of the harsh shadows created by the sun. You may consider using the flash for backlit subjects. Exposure compensation can blow out the details in the background. Use the pop-up flash to illuminate your subject instead. We have all seen the typical overexposed flash photo. If you configure your flash correctly, you won't have to worry about any blown out images. In daylight, a full-powered flash can create a harsh line between light and shadow on your subject. Instead, use flash compensation to reduce the flash power. Access flash compensation from the information display. 
you can decrease the flash power by up to three EV steps. This would result in a typical fill flash. Or you can increase the flash intensity by up to one EV step. When flash compensation is active, this icon will appear in the viewfinder. Photographers with a little more experience might want to try setting flash compensation while looking through the viewfinder. You can do this by pressing and holding the flash button on the front of the camera and the exposure compensation button. As you look through the viewfinder, turn the command dial with your right thumb to set flash compensation. You won't have to take your eyes off the subject. Return the counter to zero or reset the camera to cancel flash compensation. If you want to learn more about lighting and external flashes, pick up Blue Crane Digital's Understanding the Nikon Speed Light. This DVD offers a comprehensive look at speed lights. It includes an overview of flash sync modes and the presentation offers detailed instructions for setting up your speed light. We will show you how to control external flash units with your camera. In addition, we will demonstrate practical lighting techniques that will help you take your flash photography to the next level. Nikon's picture controls allows you to manage the tonal properties of your images. Think of this feature like the old style film stock. Before the advent of digital cameras, different kinds of film produced different looks. Computer editing programs can accomplish the same goal, but you can save a lot of post-processing time by setting the tonal properties in advance. For instance, select portrait for shooting photos of your friends. This setting enhances skin tones. It also reduces image sharpness for a softer look. Compare these results to an image taken with the landscape picture control. This setting enhances the greens and blues. Image sharpness is increased for a more vibrant look. Picture controls are only available in the advanced exposure modes. To select a picture control, go to the shooting menu. Highlight Set Picture Control and press the right arrow key. Choose a picture control from the list of options. Press OK to confirm. You can make fine adjustments to each picture control as well. Go to the Set Picture Control submenu and highlight the picture control you wish to modify. Press the right arrow key. The next screen offers controls for sharpness, contrast, brightness, saturation, and hue. Use the arrow keys to choose an item and make your adjustments. Quick Adjust simultaneously changes sharpness, contrast, and saturation. When you are done, press OK. The icon for the picture control you've selected will appear in the information display. The asterisk denotes that the setting has been changed from its default. To restore settings to their defaults, return to the picture control submenu and press the delete button or reset the camera. It is important to review your images before moving to a new subject. This will ensure you get the photos you want. After all, you can't go back and take a second shot once you have loaded the images on your computer. Press playback to display images on the memory card. The most recent photo or last viewed image will appear in the monitor. Use the right and left arrow keys or turn the command dial to advance through your images. Press the A lock button to add the protect symbol to images you wish to protect from deletion. Press it again to remove the symbol. Keep in mind that if you reformat the memory card, protected images will be erased along with unprotected ones. Press the down arrow during playback to view a different information screen. This will allow you to check the camera settings for each recorded image. These include the white balance setting, metering, ISO, and picture control. You can play back your videos from any information screen. Press OK to begin playback. Use the right and left arrow keys to advance through or rewind the clip. The zoom buttons change the volume. Press the up arrow to end playback. You may find it easier to watch your videos on a television or computer monitor. Purchase an HDMI cable to playback videos on an HDTV or monitor. Once the cable is connected, press playback on your camera. The single movie frame should appear on screen. Use the multi-selector and the OK button to play the video. With certain television sets, you may be able to start and stop the video using the TV remote. Just make sure device control is turned on from the HDMI page in the setup menu.
As you review your images, be sure to check the focus. Magnify your images to determine if they are truly in focus. Press the zoom in button to enlarge the image by up to 10 times. A small indicator superimposed over the image shows your location within the frame. Use the command dial to move between photos while magnified. Press zoom out until the full screen view returns. If you continue to press zoom out, you will see a series of thumbnails. First 4, then 9, then 72. Finally, the camera will display a calendar view of all of your images. In the center is the date list. Along the right side is a list of thumbnails for the selected date. The calendar view can be handy when you want to quickly locate a specific image. Use the multi selector to highlight a date. Press the zoom out button to toggle between the date list and the list of thumbnails. The up and down arrow keys allow you to search through the thumbnail images. Press and hold the zoom in button to preview a highlighted image. Or press OK to display the photo full screen. So far in this presentation, we have only touched on the camera menus. It's time to take a closer look. We will point out a few menu items you might find useful. Take the time to go through the menu options yourself. We have already gone over several of the shooting menu settings, including picture controls, image quality, and ISO sensitivity. Above the camera icon is the icon for playback menu. This menu offers settings for erasing and printing your images, as well as display options during playback. First on the menu is Delete. Choose Selected to mark individual images for deletion, and then erase them all at once. Use the multi selector to highlight an image. Press the zoom out button to add the delete symbol. Press this button again to remove the symbol. When you are done, press OK and confirm the deletion by selecting Yes. Choose All to erase all the unprotected images on the memory card. If you would like to delete all the photos taken on a specific date, then choose Select Date. Another option for deleting all the photos for a specific date is to use the calendar view in playback mode. Highlight the date you wish to erase. Press the delete button and choose yes to confirm. Next, we will turn on highlights from the display mode submenu. This will allow you to quickly detect overexposed areas in your photos during image playback. Go to the display mode submenu and select detailed photo info. Next, choose highlights and press the right arrow key to add a check mark to the box. When you are finished, select Done and press OK. A new information screen will be added to the display options for image playback. Access the highlights display by pressing the down arrow during playback. Any overexposed areas of your images will blink. There are limits to the brightness a camera can record. Anything above the upper limit will be discarded. Details in these areas are lost forever. If the blinking areas are small, the exposure is probably acceptable. But if most of the image is blown out, you will want to take the shot again. Because of this instant feedback, you can adjust the exposure immediately. Here is another tip. Set the camera to display portrait style images vertically during playback. Information about camera orientation is recorded for each photo as you shoot and can be used during image playback. First, go to the Setup menu by highlighting the tool icon. Make sure that Auto Image Rotation is set to On. Then, return to the Playback menu. Choose Rotate Tall and select On. Images taken with the camera held vertically will be displayed for upright viewing. This feature will not work if Auto Image Rotation was turned off when the photos were taken. We just discussed Auto Image Rotation, which is located in the Setup menu. Let's take a look at a few more items on this menu that you might find useful. Turn on Range Finder to make focusing manually easier. This feature changes the exposure indicator into a guide for focusing. Make sure the focus mode switch is turned to manual. Position your subject behind the selected focus point. As you turn the focus ring, hash marks will appear to the left or right of the zero. Marks to the left indicates the focus point is in front of the subject. Marks to the right means the focus point is behind the subject. Focus is achieved when one hash mark is displayed on each side of the zero. 
For this feature to work, you'll need a lens with a maximum aperture of 5.6 or faster. The LCD brightness option will give you a clearer view of the camera monitor in a variety of shooting environments. Reduce or increase the light intensity of the monitor to suit your needs. Choose a positive value to make changing the camera settings easier in low light. The self-timer delay option allows you to choose the length of the countdown in the self-timer release mode. The default is 10 seconds. Choose the 2 second option for images taken from a tripod that require no camera movement. You won't have to wait as long for the camera to take the shot. This button on the front of the camera can be programmed to access a feature you use frequently. It's called the function button. By default, when you press this button, you have immediate access to change the ISO. You might choose to leave ISO sensitivity as the default feature assigned to the function button. Or you can select a different feature by going to the buttons page in the setup menu. Highlight function button. Use the multi selector to view a list of options. Once you've made your selection, press OK. Now, anytime you press the function button, you have instant access to the assigned feature. Rotate the command dial to make setting changes. To return the setup menu to its default condition, choose Reset Setup Options. All of the default settings will be restored with the exception of the video mode, the time and date, language, and active folder. We covered a lot of ground over the course of this presentation. Some of it may seem very complicated. Don't worry, it will make more sense as you work with the camera. The good news is, many of the features and options are there for stylistic purposes. You can choose not to use them and still take fantastic photos. Be sure to practice the settings and techniques. Look for opportunities to improve the composition of your images. Soon, you will be taking better photos than ever before. Thanks for watching. Now go out and take some great photos.